we are here on chapter three. Uh, we're going to dive in equal employment opportunity. You can see the screen. Um, this is a, usually it's two lectures and it's a lot of material. When you think about HR, a lot of people think of uh, things like discrimination or uh, cases, um, Civil Rights Act of 1964. We'll talk about that today, stuff like that, diversity. And so um, this has been really shortened. Uh, but I think we're going to try to hit the high points so conceptually you kind of understand what's going on as we go through. So let's uh, let's get after it here. Uh, beginning with kind of the principle, the question that comes up a lot, uh, does diversity enhance firm performance? Um, so here's the idea that everyone's told kind of when they're, I don't know, when they're in fifth grade or something. Uh, we all hold hands we all we all come from different perspectives and different cultures and see different things and we all hold hands and we sing kumbaya and everything is is great um, but then reality sets in and you look at uh, the news or you see discrimination lawsuits or you see uh, history of all nations including the United States uh, with uh, different forms of gender or race discrimination and you go wait a second Maybe it's not. Maybe it's not that clear. Maybe it's not that easy. Um, so this guy set out. His name is Scott Page. He's a mathematician at the University of Michigan, and he basically set out to to generate a mathematical theorem to argue for uh, the benefit of diversity. And uh, it's it's a neat it's a neat model, and it's uh, generated a lot of conversation. And the idea, the basic logic of it, goes something like this: If you have a whole bunch of people, if there's the whole world's knowledge, okay, imagine like like a circle here, the whole world's knowledge, and a whole bunch of different types of people that know different aspects of that knowledge, and if they together generate a solution to a complex problem or work together or whatever, they're gonna have uh, more of the world's information than maybe even a super smart person, but 10 of the same kind of super smart people that know the same stuff. Um, and he argues for it. Um, and he does a good job arguing for it, a really good job. And then in response, uh, Catherine Klein and uh, I think a guy named Dave Harrison uh, responded and basically said, yeah, Scott, like, like your model makes sense. And, and we've been told this before and we know this to be true. The problem is when you get a team together that is wired different, different assumptions, different ways of communicating, different culture, different... Um, perspectives they don't always get along very well and they don't share information very well and they cite 30 years of, of research in what's called social identity theory that basically says people tend to hang out with people who are more like them people tend to work better with people who are more like them uh, the communication is similar the the nonverbal communication I don't mean like language I mean nonverbal communication meaning behind words and so trust is established more quickly and so I think the title of their paper was something like um, tidy logic and messy reality um, so I think kind of a kind of a bottom line here is does diversity just automatically plug it in does diversity enhance performance now but can diversity enhance performance absolutely it depends on how you manage it and a lot of how you management will land in the lap of a manager specifically a human resource manager so as we go through I want to keep this in mind we're gonna go through a, basically a bunch of laws today but but the big the big premise or the big idea is it's absolutely a competitive advantage to have diversity and to do it well. Uh, one of the assumptions uh, that was in Scott Page's model is the concept of inclusion. What I'm going to do is I'm just going to take 10 different types of people and throw them in a room and get them to solve a problem. Um, well, chances are the loud extrovert is going to come up with the idea and implement it. Um, the challenge is in HR, how do we create management systems, hiring systems, compensation systems, promotion systems that are inclusive, that actually get those 10 different people in that room to submit their perspective and their idea and do so in a constructive and a trusting way. So that's where the challenge lands in our lap in terms of uh, managing, managing diversity. So EEO, you probably heard the term before, Equal Employment Opportunity. Uh, a lot of it's based around the idea of unlawful discrimination. What is what is unlawful discrimination? It's discrimination on anything, particularly in the work context, uh, that violates some kind of a law, a, a, a federal, state, local, whatever law, or a common law doctrine. Um, and so 
um, we discrimination isn't the issue like like if you're dating someone you discriminated against other people and if you choose uh, an IPA over a lager you're discriminating based on your taste and the clothes we put on and I mean whatever we always just we discriminate all the time the question is the context of which we do it and on the grounds for which we do it so if I'm hiring someone and I hire the person who I think is the best performer I discriminated based on my anticipation of their performance that's appropriate. You're hiring someone to perform well at the job. The question is, what did you discriminate on, and in what context? Um, so a lot of different, a lot of different laws written on uh, age, age, color, race, ethnicity, disability, even genetic information, military status. You can see a bunch of them. We'll go through them. National origin, pregnancy, race, religion, sexual orientation. We'll uh, talk about that as well. It's at a state level, certain state levels. Washington State being one of them, but not at a federal level. Um, so here's. Uh, Equal employment opportunity, this is kind of, this is what we're going for. Employment is not affected by illegal discrimination. We want, we want legal discrimination based on who is fit for the job, who can do the job. What we don't want is illegal discrimination uh, saying, well, this person's the best candidate for the job, but hey, boy, she's six months pregnant. I mean, we're going to hire her and then she'll be gone after a little while, so I don't want to hire her now. Well, no, that's illegal discrimination. Basically saying, yeah, you've earned this job, you're the best one, but because you decided to have a family, then we're taking it away from you. So that would be considered uh, illegal. Status blind um, is usually uh, what managers kind of prefer. Sometimes there's managerial anxiety around this topic. Managers like, man, can't talk about race, can't talk about gender, can't talk about any of it. I'll probably get sued because um, they've probably seen or read horror stories and haven't been trained in it well. Um, so usually managers prefer this concept. Like I'm not looking at anybody's individual differences. I'm only looking at who can do who can do the job the best. It's a great it's a great principle. It's really difficult to execute. Um, for instance, like you guys have seen me in a couple lectures here. Uh, it doesn't take uh, too much thought to figure out uh, that I probably identify as male. That I'm probably somewhere late 30s, early 40s. Careful, it's late it's late 30s. Um, <laughs> you've probably seen me like this a couple of times. So you see, I've got a wedding ring. I mean, so we get information from people that, that we say, oh, I'm not going to get any of that information. I'm just going to look at it and see if they're a good performer. We, you can't help but get, uh, information. The question isn't if you get it. The question of course is if you use it and using it is when it becomes problematic. That's a good reminder for everybody to turn their phones off right there. Sorry about that. Okay. One other comment before we get in. There's a there's a labor economist uh, by, by the name of Thomas Sowell. He's a Hoover Institute, Stanford, um, crazy smart guy, and he argues about the cost of discrimination, right? And usually people think if a company is is discriminatory in some way, and and whether on purpose or on accident, there are two different models which we'll look at. Um, but what they're doing is they're hurting themselves uh, financially. And most of us would respond to that and be like, well, yeah, of course, because they get, you know, sued for a couple million dollars or a class action lawsuit. And that's not what he's saying. He's saying, no, no, no. If you have, if you have a labor pool, think of it as like basic supply and demand. Uh, let me use just an egregious example. So, so if I said, okay, I'm here in Ellensburg, Washington, and uh, I run a hop farm and I only am going to hire Mexican workers or Hispanic workers. Let's go more broad just because of our, our geopolitical environment here in central Washington. So Hispanic workers uh, between the ages of 20 and 40, because boy, I've had good experience and boy, they really know how to work. So that's what I'm, that's what I'm going to, uh, I'm going to hire. Thomas Sowell would say, you just artificially reduced the supply of labor by saying you're not going to consider any other uh, age category, any other racial category. Um, and if it's gender, I don't know if I said that in their gender category. So, so you just reduce the amount of people you are willing to hire from. Well, basic economics says when the supply of something is lower, the cost of that uh, commodity, or in this case, labor, is going to be higher. So if I'm willing to hire from anyone in the world, that labor is pretty cheap. If I'm willing to hire from anybody in the United States, that labor is more expensive. And the more, the smaller that I make that, that potential pool of labor, uh, the more expensive that labor becomes. Anyway, bottom line, his argument, he says, discrimination costs you money. doesn't make business sense, even if you don't get caught, uh, because the cost of labor is just going to go up, eating away at your uh, profits or availability, ability for firm survival. 
so who who kind of enforces this or decides this? So there's a, a few different uh, categories, but in a simple way, there's federal statutes, federal laws, which we'll go through. Um, that is something either executive order by the president, uh, affirmative action would be an example of that, executive order 11246, or uh, the Civil Rights Act of 1964 passed by uh, the House and the Senate signed by the president. And then there's state laws. We have in Washington State the Human Rights Commission. They are the ones that crank out a bunch of those laws. We have city governments. The city of Seattle says, hey, we're going to have $15 an hour minimum wage or, or whatever it is. Um, so there's several different levels and places it would come from, and each of those have their own unique um, unique enforcement mode. So, so for uh, an executive order, 11246 is enforced by the OFCCP. Um, Civil Rights Act of 1964 is enforced uh, by the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission. So like different, different enforcers and interpreters and regulators at each point. Uh, the last one which we'll talk about is uh, courts. In a sense, courts kind of make their own laws uh, in how they interpret the law. So sexual harassment is a great example of that. Sexual harassment um, was not written into the law in, the, in the, uh, 1964 but it is a common law doctrine, meaning this is how courts have uh, uh, consistently interpreted the law. So at this point, it's pretty much a law, even though it wasn't clearly passed by the legislature in that way. Um, so two different types of unlawful discrimination, think of it like, like categories, basically two different ways that we screw up as managers or as companies. One of them is called disparate treatment. This one is the most uh, egregious. Uh, it's usually intentional. Um, it's not usually like a big group of people. Like you, you normally wouldn't get a class action lawsuit, uh, which is like a whole class of people um, uh, suing because of disparate treatment. Usually it's one person. So uh, I applied for uh, tenure and promotion at my university and they said, no, we're not going to hire you because you're gay and uh, we don't want to promote you for that reason. Okay, that was specific, that was intentional, that was direct, that was one person, it was totally on purpose. So that's what we call disparate, or some people say disparate, whatever, treatment. It means I'm treating you um, disparately, differently, and negatively compared to, compared to everybody else. And the underlying reason for that is something that is protected legally. So if I say I am firing you because you're not showing up for work, you might, you might go, hey, hey, that's disparate treatment. You know, well, you're not showing up for work. Like, th th that's not a protected class, right? But if somebody's treating someone differently and negatively based on some protected class characteristic, then we go, yep, that's illegal, can't do that. Uh, the next one is a bit more broad, and, and I have more, like, personal experience doing cases uh, with disparate impact uh, versus disparate treatment, mainly because disparate treatment is usually it's pretty clear. It was like, that was just, just a, it's a dumb move. You said something wrong. It was illegal. It was unfair. And disparate impact happens much more unintentionally. It's like a policy that's made that negatively affects uh, a particular group of people for, for whatever reason. So this, this first came out, uh, Griggs versus Duke Power in 1971. And basically Duke Power said, look, to have a job here, you have to you have to have a high school uh, graduation, whatever diploma, and get a certain score on on an IQ test. And it was a policy that seemed like it makes sense to them. And for most people, it's like, yeah, it makes sense. You need to have the kind of base level of IQ to be able to work here. And uh, showing us that you graduated high school means shows us that you can actually complete something. You can put the work in and finish it, or, or whatever the the logic they came up with. So most people look at that and go, yeah, that 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 makes sense. That's okay. Um, so they were sued, taken to Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court said, well, no, uh, there's, there's disparate impact here, and you never actually proved that those two things, high school diploma and IQ, were related to the job in the first place. So they might be fine, but you never actually proved uh, they were connected, so you can't use it. So Duke Power comes back and says, okay, I see your point, uh, I get it, uh, I'm I'm making this conversation much faster. It was longer than this, but I see your point. I get it. You know, we did this thing. We shouldn't have done it, but we didn't mean to do it, right? So you can't just like uh, slap us with a bunch of big fines. I mean, it seemed like a good test. We were just trying to, you know, do the right thing for our company. It negatively impacted a group of people. We see it now. We won't do it again. 
uh, but it kind of it, it wasn't on purpose. Supreme Court came back and said the lack of intent to discriminate is not a defense if discrimination exists. So in in my class, um, if I ha if I gave uh, every woman uh, a D and every man an A, and I went through my process to do it, and it looked like a good process, but it had this this kind of outcome. People go, no, wait a second, that's disparate impact. You have some policy in there that treats women differently and negatively, um, whether on purpose or on accident, um, it impacted a particular group of people. And if I said, well, yeah, but like you can't fire me because I didn't do it on purpose. No, they would come back and say, you gave people Ds. Like saying I didn't mean to doesn't change their grade. Like that's not okay. So lack of intent to discriminate is no defense if discrimination uh, actually exists. Uh, okay, a few EEO concepts. We'll run through each one of these. Uh, so we get it, these are the big ones. So business necessity. Uh, you can think of it like this. There's basically two ways in which you can discriminate based on a protected category in a way that, that otherwise would be illegal, but there are two hall passes. There are two excuses uh, that are legally justified. I'm not sure a better way to say that. One of them is business necessity. Uh, so I'll give you an example of that. So uh, the test to be a, a firefighter, you throw on you know an oxygen tank and, and hoses, and you run up and down you know three, four flights of stairs, and you have to do it in a certain period of time uh, or else you don't get the job. Well, that discriminates against women on average. Um, and again, we're making huge average claims here. There's a ton of women who can do it and can beat the crap out of me. I probably couldn't do it anyway. Um, but it has to do with physical strength and biology, and that test discriminates against women. And so you look at that and go, hey, wait a second, that's disparate impact because it discriminates on the basis of gender, which it does. And fire departments come back and say, hey, look, I don't care someone's gender. What I care about is when the building is on fire, you can get there and drag out a kid before they die. And this test is related to what they would actually do on the job. Um, this is where Duke versus uh, uh, Grig, Duke Power, Griggs versus Duke Power, the last case we did. This is what they didn't do. They didn't prove it where fire stations have proven it. So that would be an example where it looks like there's discrimination, and there is discrimination, but it is legal discrimination because it's what we would call a business necessity. Uh, the second exception for this uh, is a thing called let me turn this down. Uh, is a thing called the BFOQ or bon bona fide occupational qualification. Um, the the simple example simplest example that, that people use on this is a restaurant called Hooters. Um, so you have uh, you have kitchen workers who this, they've been sued like three four times who sue Hooters to say. It is gender discrimination that men are not allowed to uh, serve tables, um, especially at, at the prime times, right, where you make the most money, Friday night, Saturday night, etc. Uh, we should be able to do that, too. And they sue based on gender discrimination. And Hooters comes back and says, yes, you're right. Uh, it is gender discrimination, and it's legal. The name of our restaurant is Hooters. There is a bona fide occupational qualification. You have to have a certain set of equipment uh, to be a server. So... Yes, it is gender discrimination. Yes, gender discrimination is illegal. But in this case, there is a BFOQ, a bona fide occupational qualification for why it's okay to discriminate. Uh, this happens from time to time on age as well. Um, but there is no BFOQ for race. Uh, so, for instance, uh, you might go to a, a local uh, Chinese food restaurant and apply. And they say, no, we're not going to hire you. Um, and you notice that everybody who's working there uh, at least looks Asian to you. And you go, hey, wait a second, that's, that's race, race discrimination. Um, the restaurant should not say, well, yes, you have to look Asian to serve Asian food because we want to give our customers uh, an authentic experience. They should not say that because that's illegal. That's race discrimination. Do they do that? They probably do. Probably lots of restaurants do that. Is it illegal? Yes, it is. So why don't we hear about it getting challenged? I don't know. Probably doesn't happen on a massive scale um, is why. It's usually smaller companies. You can always tell, like, uh, follow the money, right? The, a lot of these uh, major lawsuits that, that changed uh, uh, rulings or that brought about laws um, were usually pretty big in big companies, so you have a big high-end team of lawyers chasing it down. Uh, no one is usually going to sell kind of the, the mom or sue the mom-and-pop 
uh, you know, pho shop down the street, they'd sue Panda Express as an alternative. They have deeper pockets. So anyway, those are the two uh, the two exceptions to it, two exceptions to discrimination uh, laws. And uh, okay, burden of proof. Uh, burden of proof is fun. That switched in uh, 1991. So the, the burden of proof means the burden. So you kind of want to avoid that if you can. The burden is on you to prove something happened. So so if a student in my class said, hey, James ran over my dog, um, they have to actually prove that. I don't have to prove that I didn't run over your dog. You have to prove that I did run over your dog. So the burden of proof is on you. It's slightly different in cases of employment discrimination. Um, so if I accuse my employer of discrimination somewhere, or sexual harassment or something, um, it's kind of the idea they're innocent until they're proven guilty, sort of. When I accuse them, if I can provide a, a little bit of evidence, circumstantial evidence, or maybe I have a witness or something, then the burden of proof shifts. It shifts to the organization. So now the organization has to defend that they didn't do it rather than me trying to argue that they actually did do it. Um, organizations, uh, lawyers will avoid as much as possible uh, getting the burden of proof on them. Proving you didn't do something is really hard. Like, I, like I'm saying, you discriminated against me based on religion. And I have some friends who kind of agree with me, and there was a comment made about a Bible in an interview that I had, and that's why I think I didn't get the job. And you might say, well, you didn't get the job because you're not qualified. Well, now you actually have to prove it. You as the organization have to prove you're innocent. I no longer have to prove that you're guilty. So burden of proof is a big, expensive deal, which is why you hear a lot about companies will settle. They're like, we're not going to fight this in court. It takes too much time to argue we didn't do something wrong. We're going to write the person a check and make them go away. Okay.